For those out of the loop, if you don't know, when Guild Wars 2 has a big patch, the devs for a long while now have been taken to Reddit and answering questions on all manner of different topics. Technically, they call these developer celebrations nowadays. But uh, yeah, it's something that they do, and there's a huge number of things to get through. I wanted to do a summary for you all here, give you the best of the best answers, my take on them, and kind of teach us all a little bit more about the development of the game, and uh, what may be coming up, and some of the things that were going on behind the scenes with this patch. So let's just jump right on in. We're going to open with a statement from uh, uh, the game director, and it's a mic. But for the first time, I believe the first time, it's not Mike O, who sort of saw many of these things through in Heart of Thorns and Living World Season 3 days. We're actually getting a message straight up from Mike Z this time, who they kind of have the news that he's formally become game director. We'll get to in just a second. So Z says this, Hi everyone, with today's release, we are excited to unveil the first episode of our newest season of Living World. Starting today, you'll be able to explore a brand new open world zone in Alona. You'll get a glimpse of the events during the rise of Palawa Joko in the Fractals. You'll gather your friends for a new challenging raid that lets you journey into the underworld, enjoy a new section for keys in the wallet, freeing up some of your inventory space and more. As has been tradition, members of the various teams that support the live game are here to answer your questions. Thanks for joining us here today and in Enjoy Daybreak. So then he lists all the people that are there. He says, as with previous AMAs, here are our ground rules, uh, which essentially make it not an AMA. They, as I say, they kind of call this a, a dev celebration. We're here to chat with you about the new content and the new season of Living World. We will not discuss or reveal features or items that are currently in development. And please respect that many of your fellow players might have not have finished the episode yet, so please use spoiler tags appropriately. Finally, we're excited you joined us this afternoon. This is the first episode of a new season of Living World and the start of a new journey for all of us together. Once again, thank you all for your support and for being a part of an amazing community, Z. And then later he edits to uh, conclude it. So yeah, that's the introductory statement. Um, and you might be wondering, well, why is Z doing it? We've got a follow-up statement as well from Mike O, a little bit deeper in the thread, which says... Hi all, a few months ago I announced my intention to gradually hand the reins of Guild Wars 2 game direction to Mike Z. You probably already know him very well, he's a 10 year veteran of ArenaNet who worked on Guild Wars 2 from the beginning and most recently served as the lead designer of Path of Fire. I'm not going anywhere, Z and I sit next to each other and continue to work together, but I won't be able to continue spending virtually all my time on Guild Wars 2 in the coming year as I did through most of the past two years. A game director should be 100% dedicated to the game. Z Z is absolutely dedicated to Guild Wars 2. He has a deep passion and enthusiasm for the game, the same today as when he started working on it a decade ago. As game director, I know he'll continue to champion the needs of players and continue to set the highest quality standards for everything we do. So today I'm making it official. Mike Z is the game director of Guild Wars 2. Congratulations, Z. And then below that, we had uh, a few people congratulating him. And so this will be interesting to see sort of what his style is as game director. I have to say, I am putting on my tinfoil hat here a little bit. I'm very interested in the wording from Mike O here. Earlier statement kind of all suggested Mike O was only going to be game director for a little while because he was running the company and the business side stuff and it was a lot on his plate. But then when we get his actual departure message here, you'll notice it doesn't really say anything about that. And particularly the line in there about being 100% dedicated to that game. I don't know, it seems like, and I wouldn't be surprised, I talked about this on a stream quite recently, I wouldn't be surprised if ArenaNet have something else cooking and it's kind of interesting to me to look at the way this is worded and he doesn't explicitly say, oh, I'm going to do business stuff. I wonder if what he's now doing is actually game direction on another project. And because he can't give his 100% to Guild Wars 2 any longer, uh, maybe he has to go do that and they sit next to one another. Am I going off the deep end there? Kind of curious to look at, but obviously the thing that's important for us to know is, uh, yeah, we got a new game director and we'll see how things are handled. So with all that preamble out of the way, let's get into some of the questions that the community asked. The first one here is from Commander Fryer, who says, In the previous Ask Me Anythings, you've mentioned reviewing the economic impact of sigil swapping of legendary weapons. Is sigil swapping something you are still looking into? If so, what obstacles are you still facing to get it done? If not, why not? This is a really interesting question to me because I kind of thought the whole thing was dead and buried and the devs have been very clear about it being dead and buried. And I kind of looked a bit awkwardly at people who were still going on about it. And yet in this AMA, I get egg on my face because Mike responds and he says, as we looked into how to support sigil swapping on legendary weapons, it opened up the investigation to larger issues with the system as a whole. It's still something I'd like us to address, but I want the design team to take the time to do it right. 
So that's very much an open door, and I will change my tune wholly on that now. Perhaps people are right to expect legendary weapon sigil swapping. I wonder what this larger issue is. Is he talking from a technical standpoint with regard to implementing the sigil swaps and how feasible that is? Or is he talking about just general loot and reward structures and economic structures very broadly within the game? Which is what I'd been led to believe the complications were related to before. And if it is the latter of those categories, whatever change would facilitate the legendary weapon sigil swapping could change a huge number of things of the game. I also have a hunch that that might key into some build template ideas and early developments and things which could just put the whole thing on hold you know uh, on hold it's like they have to get all their ducks in a row figure out what the entire system is going to look like in the end with an infrastructure with build templates on it and then finally address how the sigil swap swapping and stuff works but you know sigils when you look at lower tier sigils as well the green sigils the uh, yellow sigils none of these things quite seem to fit very well at the moment so i do think whatever they're thinking of is is going to be broad but there you go, so uh, legendary sigil swapping, and it was uh, quite a splash of cold water in my face, the first question on the AMA, because it was something that I didn't even think there was any discussion left on, but there you have it. Dark FQ chips in with a question here, since Heart of Thorns, I've been wondering what happened to the Nightmare Court, a great lore question. So my question is, what did happen to the Nightmare Court? I know this is not a question about new content, but I've been dying to know this missing lore. Definitely uh, with the introduction of New Duchess at the end of Dragon Stand. So this question has floated around a few times in the past, and we've had different devs chime in on it. Uh, here we get Mike Z, who says, There are many stories and many more side stories that we want to tell. Some of them evolve during development, and some get pushed aside so that we can focus on larger plot points. As we plan a season's arc, we try to focus on bringing together compelling storylines and characters without providing too many distractions. And that comment there, for what it's worth, about too many distractions, we've definitely heard before. He says, in this particular case, I have a personal investment in Duchess Chrysantha, as I created that instance in Dragon Stand, so I feel your uh, concerns. This is interesting to me. I wonder what he's getting at there. Does that mean that because he's game director right now and he has a personal stake in it too there's a higher chance we'll be able to see it i mean these things are collaboratively made right so surely it can't be that is this essentially just saying yeah i feel you bro but it's not gonna change uh which would be a bit of a shame this is always an interesting one to look at for me because obviously any cut content or signs of content that could have been that we didn't get we're always gonna uh lament the loss of and then on top of that it's a really interesting part of the story i think that the nightmare court was one of the most poorly handled parts of the Heart of Thorns era uh, because they should have had such a big stake in that whole Silvari centric stuff uh, and so yeah I don't know really what that means but hey uh, perhaps we'll get more clarification in the future what I would say is if there is absolutely no chance on those answers whatsoever maybe just tell us out of the game you know it's not too much worse than having all that pivotal information in that Scarlet story blog post once upon a time uh, it's, you know, it would at least be something, throwing some of us a bone. But hey, I guess uh, that leads into all other manner of discussions about where they can release information and it can still be considered canon. And uh, I guess maybe they don't want to get into that. So there you go. Uh, next question is from Zach Soul, who said, My question is in regard to balance. Is there any talks or plans to increase the frequency of balance updates? Maybe smaller updates and tweaks that every few weeks or month. I really like this question. As you guys know, I'm a big advocate for more frequent balance. I don't ask for more substantial changes or, you know, basically them to do superhuman work. I just rather these big patches get broken into slightly smaller ones that look less exciting on the face of it, but also lead to less hyperbole and uh you know rioting and outrage and stuff because if they get things slightly wrong a patch can rectify it very quickly anyway so irenio um uh, responds here so this is one of the priority devs that's been doing balance for a while now was responsible for uh soul beast i think it was definitely scourge uh three of the new ones Irenio says this, balance patches take a good amount of it time to implement and even more time to vet and test the changes. That is a good chunk of why they're on a quarterly cadence. So basically, it's hard work, guys. That's why they're quarterly. Uh, Path of Fire shook up quite a few things, and there have been talks internally about temporarily pushing changes out more frequently to address concerns that have arisen. To that end, the Skills and Balance Squad has been putting in solid work to prepare a small bonus balance patch that shouldn't interfere with the regular cadence. So, I really like the clarity of what he said here. He's basically saying, no, look, it's going to be quarterly, but this was a big release, and so we are putting out some, uh, an at least one extra little one here. So, I wonder exactly what that will rectify, uh, and it's nice to see that they're agile enough that they can put, throw a little tweak out like that. But there you have it, guys. It seems like quarterly is here to stay, and their answer is, look, it's just hard work. 
And who are we to disagree, I suppose? Next question is from Bob Moses, who's posting an immediate reply to Irenio there. He says, to hitchhike off of this question, how are buffs and nerfs determined? And how do you get balance between world versus world, PvP, and PvE, fractals and raids, and so on and so on and so on. Let's just go straight to Irenio's answer, who says, We look at each game mode and watch for constructive feedback from Tyrion's in-game, the official forums, and other internet communities. Community perspective makes a difference on where we look to make changes. That's interesting to hear that really the community is swaying things. The viability of each profession in each game mode is a goal we are moving towards. What will we be doing? This is an incredibly broad question, so I'm left to answer it in a very broad fashion. Updating professions to create space for each to be desirable and fun in each mode. Such changes vary from profession to profession and mode to mode. For example, in competitive modes, we look at improving or creating counters to top builds to bring less played professions into greater use. I really like what he says at the end. I know it's a broad answer. We can't really pull too much, but I like what he says at the end there that if you're going to try... That's basically nerfing meta builds to increase diversity but instead of actually tackling the meta build itself and making people feel like they've lost their toy you just buff counters and i like that kind of stuff moving on we've got uh rayonate who says question for the living world team with season three uh being only six episodes was it six how many episodes should we expect for this season of a living story he's going for the big guns this is a big question right here and gail says we mentioned previously that season four would approximately follow the same two to three month cadence as season three so you can look for that as for how many comma well comma you'll know more about that in the future i don't know why i read those commas out loud there smiley face you'll know more about that in the future i guess that just makes sense uh and maybe i shouldn't look too deeply into this but there is a definite idea out there guys because there is no content drought so to speak for living world this time we've gained plus nine months so if in a year and a half we get another expansion, that still leaves enough time for season four to be nine episodes instead of six. There's a lot of reason to believe this season could be a lot longer. Or, it, you know, the next uh, expansion might come out quicker. I don't know. Let's not get head over heels in excitement here. But there are very real valid reasons to believe that maybe this one will be a bit longer. And uh, Gail didn't say anything here to counter that. I think it was a good question, even though we were always going to get a bit, a bit of a waffly answer. Moving on, we've got Arena Ben, who says, uh, basically was asked about fractal instabilities, among many other things. Uh, fractal instabilities, I think, is a good topic, though, because if you really look at fractals, they scale in, mechanic, in mechanical terms and other terms quite a lot now. So the instabilities almost feel like a tacked-on thing. They're there to change the experience of the fractals, but as the fractal team gets better at changing the core experience of the fractals anyway to introduce more mechanics and things, it's like the instabilities aren't quite necessary, or they sort of... They add on top of a much more worthwhile system anyway. So what is their real place? Uh, so I do think there's something worth being looked at. And Ben seems to say that the Fractal team are. So he says we are experimenting internally with putting them on a weekly random rotation. Though we also want more instability so the pool is larger. I agree with both of those ideas. Now on the random thing, somebody later in the AMA, I don't have a screenshot for you all. On the random thing though, someone said... Hey, uh, this could be horrible. I would just skip, uh, you know, doing my 100 if it's last laugh and, you know, these various combinations. And the uh, devs responded again saying, well, look, if we do it, it will be a little, a little bit more intelligent than pure randomness. Like, so I guess they'll have like a bucket of instabilities that can potentially land on any single scale. And they'll do it that way. I really like this idea and more improvements for fractals. And that would let the instabilities work as a real distinct system that stands on their own. So good stuff to hear. And I'm happy to, to see that the fractal team keep making changes that I very much agree with. So cool stuff. Not to suggest that that's a guaranteed promise. They did just say experimenting, but there you go. Next question. Uh, we have Gail as well, who was talking about bags. Again, this is a response to a huge wall of text. So I've just cut the wall of text out. But if you guys don't know... Uh, the new bags you can craft from Path of Fire, which I personally have been going for, the like 24 slot and 28 slot versions are soul bound. And originally so was the 32 slot, but people said this is weird and stupid. Why would you do this? So the devs changed it to be account bound. But when they changed it to be account bound, they only did it for the 32 slot. The other two, despite being extremely expensive, are still weirdly soul bound restricted, despite the fact all bags in the game are account bound. So if you follow all of that, Gail tries to answer the question and says the reason that the 32 slot bag was changed was because it's an ascended item and ascended items are account bound by nature. I don't know about future bags, but I found that tidbit really interesting and wanted to share it for those who might not have realized the background on that change. 
I don't find that interesting at all. I think any Guild Wars 2 player knows that Ascended stuff is always account-bound stuff. The question here, though, is all bags are account-bound anyway, so that, isn't that a bit weird and arbitrary? Why do we have some expensive, difficult-to-obtain bags at endgame that have less quality of life than the preceding ones? That's the point. Most 20-slot bags are account-bound anyway, and now you've made them solve bound. So I get the whole discussion. For me, I'm going for the 32 slots anyway, so I don't really care. Um, and I'm just skipping through. I think there was also a bit of a problem with crafting, where if it was soulbound and then you tried to craft it into the higher version on another character, it'd be weird. Anyway, probably a bit uh, detailed of a discussion, but there you have it. There's a slight answer for you guys. Lots of text here, uh, and I believe it will be followed up with a lot more text. Deviant Shark says, it's not really a question. I'd just like to point out that the music you guys are dropping into the game is about the best we've had. It's been, in my eyes, the most consistent things in terms of quality. It's been amazing since the game launched in 2012 and has only improved. So to form a question, what can we expect? It's a bit of a non-question, uh, but the answer actually blew my mind. And I don't know whether this is a good thing to have blown my mind or not. So, Arena Keenan says, thanks for the kind words. This release, Daybreak, remember, just Daybreak, this release was actually huge for us musically, with between 8 and 14 new tracks, depending on how you count variants and cinematic pieces. I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, it's the most new music in any single release outside of Core, Heart of Thorns, or Path of Fire. That is insane, and why this blows my mind as an answer is I didn't recognize any new music the entire time I've played Daybreak so far. And I'm not I'm not saying that the devs are liars by any stretch. I'm saying I wonder if that means the music isn't very distinct sounding or that's something about my own perception. I'm sure there'll be lots of people in the comments calling me an idiot for having missed out on that. But wow, there's been eight new tracks, even if we are conservative about what we consider a new track. And I didn't notice a single one. Are there like some remakes of old Istan stuff in there? I really, uh, wow, that blows my mind completely. But there you have it. Uh, we also had a response from Drew who said thanks for the kind words. They take the craft very seriously. And of course, if you follow Guild Wars 2 for a long time, you'll know that those audio guys certainly do seem to. Next, we have some story hints. Can we expect something else other than chasing after the next new baddies in Living World Season 4? Gets a response from Jessica that is just a smiley face. Then we have a spoilery question here. Why didn't Balthazar Curse listen? Now, I talked about this very enthusiastically on the channel. It's something I'm extremely interested in. Uh, if you guys need a quick reminder, at the very end of Path of Fire, it, with Balthazar's last gasp, he curses all the gods except Lissa. Why doesn't he say her name? Uh, and, you know, this is one of those things where you can either really be like, wow, this is an amazing hint at something, or you can think, oh, they just forgot to say it, it was just a voice acting thing, it's not meant to be focused on, because it's very de-emphasized in the moment. Uh, but amazingly on the AMA, Jessica says, I can't answer the spoiler, sorry, and thank you. So, there is an answer! There is an answer, and it was deliberate that he didn't curse Lissa. I think many of us kind of knew, but some people thought it was a bit tin foily. Do you believe me now that it might have some significance? Because uh, I think that's, that's telling us something. We'll have to see, I guess. All right, now here's the massive wall of text I was talking about. Uh, it's really interesting to me. Um, it's uh, It centers around a lot of messages that came from ArenaNet HOGM. I actually don't know the name of this dev. It probably said it at the start, but I didn't look. So... Uh, what we're talking about is marketing here. Marketing's had a lot of discussion lately. We obviously had just before Path of Fire came out in one of the big AMAs. Mo was talking about the strength of word of mouth. I really ran with that ball. I'm doing the competition and I try to, you know, help world word of mouth as best I can. But at some point you have to look at the stuff that ArenaNet themselves are doing and question, is the marketing good enough? And they just got a new uh, global head of marketing. It's this dev in the AMA. And they seem really extraordinarily enthusiastic and engaged with the community. Uh, I'm sure that will disappear with enough years in the industry as people become desensitized and disgusted with trying to interact with the internet. But for now, we've got someone enthusiastic who's talking a lot and it could mean good things to the marketing. So let's have a look, okay? Starts from random user up there, the legend himself, and he says, Is there any reason why you refuse to make trailers that actually show the new content? The living, uh, the living story trailers you release focus on teasing about the story, but that's not what the majority cares about in the patches. So, why not show what you have coming content-wise? I feel like your marketing really could improve. I agree with what the OP starts with here, but I would also add that a lot of people do care about the story, but this marketing really should be pushing outside Guild Wars 2, right? And for people who aren't playing the game actively, they really don't care about the story. When we're talking about majorities within that sphere, definitely. Like, no one's gonna care if they see a random little Asura girl in Jeopardy or something when they don't know who it is or any of the context. So I think that's a really important point. So, 
uh, the dev responds, or the global head of marketing, I should say, responds. We have a delicate dance in which we want to show as much of the new content as we can to our fans, while we have a strong desire to not spoil any of the reveals and surprises within. We will take this feedback into consideration and look how we make this dance a little better. And you know, I'm someone that thrives on doing trailer analyses, and I love the story, and a lot of people like watching me do that and getting involved with it as well. But that's just for us already in there, and I do think that it doesn't do well enough to explain just how big some of these patches are, like this triple release. Even if this wasn't a triple release, even if it was just Istan, the amount of repeatable content and stuff that came in on Daybreak uh, is insane, and is of a higher quality than any of the Season 3 stuff. But people just don't know from the trailers. So anyway, another response. I understand that you don't want to spoil anything, and I agree that it keeps the surprises amazing. However, listing the features we'll be getting in the trailer along with a small image with them, like the teasers, would already create much more hype. Continued story, a new raid, a new fractal, and so on. This is great. We always want feedback, they say, from our fans to further our collective success in the Guild Wars 2 franchise. We'll look at this feedback for our future trailer rele releases. Another response uh, says that currently no one outside the game gets excited about any major content releases like today's one. And we as a community can't get anyone excited because we barely know anything before the patch hits. We want you to surprise us, but we can't talk about your game and create buzz when we barely know anything. I feel like that's a sort of conceited attempt to just get lots of information early. Uh, but I get the, the gist of that comment, and once again, we have a response that's a very fair point. And it's something we're currently discussing here at ArenaNet. We want to arm our friends with the tools to drive new players into Guild Wars 2. The content is something we provide first and foremost to our existing fans, and it makes me proud to work here. But you are right in pointing out that we need to leverage new content to engage a new audience. And here, this last sentence is the bit that genuinely excited me. Uh, we have some ideas around this, as well as driving the franchise to a broader fan base, but please feel free to share any thoughts you have. Keep your eyes peeled over the next two years to see a new kind of marketing intended to surprise and delight existing and new fans. Keep our eyes peeled over the next two years. So that's the life cycle of POF, I guess you could say, the next two years. And they've got a new kind of marketing intended. I mean, pff, shouldn't the release of Path of Fire and Daybreak count as that? And that's very much disappointed people, as we all know. If that's the new delighting and surprising thing, I'm not so sure about it. But, uh, but yeah, very interesting. And again, this person seems extremely responsive. So if you guys have thoughts on the marketing, it actually seems legitimate, sincerely, they will take on board your feedback. It doesn't end there, though. And again, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, somebody else, just Lemony, responded by saying, hey, look at the Nightmare Fractal teaser from 2016. That wasn't even that long ago to me, but there you go. Uh, if you could market all the upcoming content and release in one cohesive trailer, that would be great. Uh, that's appreciated, they say. Love examples of what you feel works, particularly when it's from us. But also, please share things you love from other games, as we want to do our best to promote Guild Wars 2. CGI trailers, baby! Uh, <laughs> obviously out of budget, probably. Next response says, I hope you sincerely take this feedback on board. This release was extremely important to keep new players from staying longer, and I feel like you missed a lot of potential with lackluster teasers we got. I mean, there's so much content being released today, and we literally saw none of it to hype the community up. Anti-hype is the worst thing a game can have. It makes people apathetic towards a game, and that's poisonous. It's weird to see the flip as well, how people people uh, are really starting to clamor for much more marketing and hype uh, where you know if you, we rewind the clock three four years people felt like they were marketing things to look a lot bigger and better than they actually were in the end and everyone felt burnt by that uh, then we have I have a strong passion for what I do marketing is something I love and have done for longer than I care to admit specifically in gaming I joined ArenaNet a little over two months ago because it's a company that puts fans first which is so important and rare in this industry Fan feedback is a cornerstone of Guild Wars 2 success, and I want to utilize your passion to evangelize Guild Wars 2 and ArenaNet in the most meaningful way possible. Please continue to give uh, feedback at any point, and I promise you it will be taken seriously. I mean, listen to how sincere this is. And uh, the response was, well, now I'm hyped to see what you'll do next. I'll be keeping you on your word. Please do keep me honest, smiley face or winky face. Oh, and it goes on. We have all this here as well. Uh, I think this was the least marketed release of all. It's really gone downhill since the first Halloween release. That was the pinnacle of Guild Wars 2 marketing, in my opinion. I mean, we've gone from the team making up a song and showing cutscenes and having a dedicated page of the website to just posting panned back still images on Twitter on two of the major features, the Raid and the Fractal. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say the marketing was sad for this release. They say, hi, it's really hard to hear this feedback, but we take it seriously. I'm proud of the work that the marketing team is doing, but it needs to reach our fans and potential new fans. I mean, I personally am really excited to see that second bit. New fans! 
Uh, hearing what has resonated with you previously is beneficial, and I encourage you to stay tuned. And it just goes on and on and on and on, guys. So what do you think here? I mean, I, I do apologize for people who aren't that interested in all these walls of tech to do the marketing. But I like seeing that enthusiasm. You know, there's genuinely a lot of passion here, it seems. Whether enthusiasm and passion actually translates into talent and good work being done and a good product at the end, obviously... Uh, is a question I'm more than familiar with myself, so I guess we will see. But it uh, seems pretty interesting, right? And uh, I hope that uh, we do see some new initiatives for Arena Net Marketing and how that goes. And uh, and yeah, I'm curious how you guys felt in the comments. Again, sorry if it was a bit verbose and long uh, to you all, but uh, there you have it. That's generally how they were in the AMA here, actually. Very verbose and very responsive to a lot of different things. Moving on, we've got Clint Charwood, who says, Hi, my question is mainly about the release schedule of raids. So, obviously, throughout the last 12 months, the raids were not releasing as frequently as we thought. There were threats of a lot of teams leaving. There was, you know, a potential even a bigger drop in the population of people who've been playing the raids. It certainly strikes me very few people have gone into the underworld so far. Eight to nine months for a new raid wing is really slow. And are there any plans to release newer wings in quicker succession like wings two and three originally were? Uh, and ArenaNet Jason says, we are planning to release raids with more regularity this season. I know that's an extremely short, especially when we compare it to the stuff a second ago. I know that seems extremely curt and short and thus unimportant. But actually, I think ArenaNet Jason is going to be held pretty hard to this. I can very much imagine two years down the line when there's another big break in raids for whatever reason. Uh, this quote right here, get ready to see someone uh, salty posting a screenshot of this here. Uh, so let's see if they can actually land that. They are planning to release raids with more regularity this season. I guess we'll see whether they can make it. And obviously that's very exciting to the people who are uh, managing to raid a lot right now and are itching to do more content. Especially those who are satisfied by the balance of the underworld. Next, I paid for WinRAR. Hey man, I paid for WinRAR once as well. People always say that's a weird thing to do. I, I legitimately paid for WinRAR once. Anyway, recently uh, ArenaNet switched from NCSoft servers to ones hosted by Amazon on the East Coast. Many players have reported an increase in overall ping with significant lag spikes as a result. West Coast players are looking at 30 MS increase and for many Oceanic users, the game is on the verge of unplayable. Going forward, is ArenaNet going to commit to these new servers or is there a possibility of reverting this decision? I must say, uh, as a note here, I hadn't heard of any of this or noticed any of this, but supposedly it's a thing. Uh, Mike O responds, who says, We've been migrating services over to Amazon for a period of months. Amazon has better pe peering relationships for its data centers than we could hope to have individually. We're also using newer, faster servers at Am Amazon than the ones we were using previously. In general, we, we've seen a better play experience. We've seen lower latency and fewer network out outages to Amazon servers. Uh, which would correlate with my experience playing the game, but there you have it. Uh, some of you have reported an opposite experience. Stephen Clark Wilson has been investigating the reports, collecting trace routes and ping plots. He's out today, or he'd answer this question himself, but please continue to work with him if you're having trouble. And uh, you remember, SCW was the guy also who uh, responded on the Guild Wars 1 subreddit when a transition was going there. The guy is a boss, and he will respond to you. So if you've got concerns about that, uh, I'm sure he will help you out. Quite often when I look at dev posts on Reddit, it's him, uh, which is pretty cool. And I mean outside of AMA times too. Uh, moving on, we've got uh, Next Raid Wen saying, Are there plans to improve the DPS, Golem? Choosing boon slash buffs is clunky. There's no way to test your DPS if it relies on allies like Venoms. Resetting the Golem is cumbersome. A simple UI change would do wonders for at least some of these problems. I agree completely. I reckon I would... I, I find benchmarking pretty boring. And grinding benchmarking is pretty boring. But it would be a lot more tolerable and interesting to me if the UI was slightly different. This is one of those things where they add the feature and now they will forever be asked. Can you improve this? Can you improve this? Can you improve this? It will never go away. This is just going to be the next iteration of what people are asking for. Uh, but they do get a response. There was a small overhaul that went out with today's release. I failed on the patch notes, so I don't actually know what that is because it wasn't on the patch notes. Also, I don't believe small overhauls exist, FYI. But anyway, while it doesn't address the UI, the SFTA arena is still a living space and I do plan on to continuing improving it. And they have to keep improving that as balance changes, as new bu buffs and things come into the game, it needs to keep getting updated. So yeah, hopefully they do something a bit more radical and get the golems up. Uh, having preset golem configurations and uh, buff and boon configurations would be really nice. So you can just click a button and it respawns, resets you in combat and away you go. But yeah, we'll see. 
big question here, but it's about narrative. So screw you guys. You can enjoy it. Here we go. This question is mostly for the narrative team. So I haven't had a chance to play through the episode in today's release. I think the community has some concerns about the continuity of the narrative between episodes. Some episodes can feel really jarring or out of place. Like episodes 3 and 6 in season 3, in hindsight, felt like huge detours. What are you doing in season 4 to make the narrative feel more cohesive? So remember, 3 is a crack in the ice, which did feel like a detour in the end as it was the only sort of northern snowy stuff we ended up dealing with and episode six felt like a detour because it had the livia and all stuff and it almost felt like an extra to the entire season so what do we get here we get jessica responds again who already commented a little bit on story stuff earlier and says oh this is one of my favorite topics and something that we're working really hard on right now we've instituted a lot of different processes and ways to work together to try and make sure we're all on the same page especially since we have different teams working on different episodes one of the main things we're doing is making sure that senior design people are present in all the story breaking meetings and that the writers for the previous and subsequent episodes are present for episode outlining meetings to ensure that they fully understand the episodes coming before and after theirs. I'm also in all of those meetings so there's at least one person who's present for every story meeting. There are now at least two people who see all of the dialogue that goes into the season which should help with consistency. I believe strongly that A, everything in a game tells a story and B, if you're not telling a story intentionally, you're telling one unintentionally. I think she's run both those points like more than maybe she even realizes. Uh, we're looking at all the things in the content that might be telling stories unintentionally or in ways that aren't integrated with the rest of the content and weaving them together. Right now, the primary focus is on ensuring that dialogue and gameplay support and enhance one each other, but we're always working on drawing in other elements of the game to do that as well. It's a continually evolving process and we're not always going to get it perfect on the first try, but we're excited about what we've already accomplished and what's coming up because we think that evolution is going to result in deeper and more engaging storytelling. So kind of a fluffy response, but there's a lot of nice little bits bits in there actually especially this idea of pairing gameplay to story i think is extremely important and it's something that guild wars 2 at core completely neglected to understand moving on we also have another response from tom who says, excellent question, and it's something we've identified as an area we can improve on. Uh, we've taken numerous productive steps to increase frequency and depth of communication between the writers, narrative designers, and the content designers, and we've added new roles that are specifically meant to facilitate better communication and track and guide continuity between the episode teams themselves and across the episodes. For example, for instance, say hi to Living World story editor Jessica. We expect these steps to make this season of Living World the most serialized and connected one so far, and we can't wait to hear what you think about that aspect. Please do let us know as the season goes on. So this is great. This should mean nothing feels like filler. Nothing feels out of place. Nothing feels suddenly introduced and, and, and then dropped. Nothing seems to hint at something but was accidental, which I'm sure happens all the goddamn time. You know, someone like me will go online. I'll do a mysteries video about something they hadn't even thought of. And then there's like an expectation they pay off on it, even though it was never on the books. Stuff like that. Hopefully there will be less of. I will say, just from playing Daybreak... I can already feel a lot stronger sense of where we're going, what it's about, what we're doing. That might break down over the next couple of episodes, but so far, hopefully, these new things they've done are in place. And it's nice to see, you know, just more efficiencies and understanding of how the company can be structured should make better living world as we go. Next question from the community was worded very oddly. Will there be a reality in which you reopen the crown spelt with a K pavilion? <laughs> Good question nonetheless. I think a lot of us uh, reminisce fondly over the crown pavilion and want to go back there. Why I picked this from the AMA though is because of the reference to a team here. So it's not currently being worked on, but it's on the festival team's mind as a potential product uh, project. And Gail says that makes me really happy. I love the festivals and I'm always delighted to know there may be more. The festival team? Now, somebody correct me down below, but is this the first we heard of a festival team? I thought, I thought it was like a current events team. Is, is, is it the current events team? Is that just another name for the same group of people? There you go. They have a festival team, it seems. Hmm, I wonder what that means. And uh, yeah, that'd be kind of cool if 2018 we get to go back. I guess we'll see. Question about the new legendary from Daybreak right here. Matt, can you tell us what it was like to design the focus? It's such a neat weapon that I never expected to happen and I'm really digging it. A really interesting answer on this one. For the most part, we let our amazing artists come up with the idea that they want to make for the game. For specific artistic inspirations, you'd have to talk to Chelsea. I'm trying to figure out if she has an official Reddit account. I know she was very passionate about making the smoky demon hand. We talked a lot about what the precursors would look like after we had a pretty solid vision of the final legendary inn. I came up with the idea that you're trapping this demon and he is reluctantly under your control. And there's this subtle story told through the look and names of the precursors to get you there. Now, this 
this is interesting because you're going to hear a message in a second as well that this was one of the earliest Gen 2 legendary weapons that they thought of. And in those early days, when it was like Nevermore and stuff, there were going to be these huge sweeping stories associated with those legendaries. So we could have got some interesting lore on a demon. And uh, that's always really juicy when it comes to Guild Wars, and I wish we had a lot more of. But of course, the new acquisition method kind of limits how much they can tell us with that. So moving on, here, here are those messages. Uh, originally, I thought that when Mo decided to bring legendaries back in Living what Story Episode 2, that they would be the designs that were originally planned to release for the jungle, but couldn't be finished in time for release. But as more and more of the Season 3 legendaries came out, it became pretty clear that these were completely new designs that were always in some way related to the episode they came with, like an obsidian mace for the volcano island with obsidian structures on it, a quaggon bowl for an icy quaggon outpost, a pirate ship for the city docks, a flame god for the flame god, and of course a literal piece of ore for ore and the literal shining blade for the patch that brought them back. So, when did you decide to scrap your Heart of Thorns legendary ideas and instead design completely new ones for the living world? And what happened to those original ideas? It's kind of an aggressive comment in my opinion. I don't think it is 100% cut and clear that they scrapped all of the Heart of Thorns ones as the co uh, question asker eventually just assumes to be the reality. Uh, but it is an interesting question and it is funny how many of those lined up. So what is the real story? I've actually seen this be asked in several AMAs and not be answered. Here we get a response from Mo, who says, We did use the art we'd already developed for Heart of Thorns Legendaries when we started releasing Legendaries in the new system. Some of those first period pairings were fortuitous. We had Eureka art, we had Shushadu art, and we were able to pair them with the episodes that they made sense with. And so that's the story, that they were just fortuitous. Now obviously there are going to be people that are thinking they're lying there. And uh, no, they just hadn't made anything for Heart of Thorns and, you know, they, they'd fallen behind and so on. And that's why they all got cancelled. Uh, so it's kind of nice then that we get another response here from Lindsay, who uh, goes a bit further with a bit more depth. Says, no, we never scrapped any ideas. We simply took the ones we had and we paired them to the release they were closest themed to. There are a couple of exceptions to that. But it wasn't that we scrapped a design, we just hadn't come up with anything for that weapon type yet, and someone was inspired by up to upcoming content. In the case of Shushadu, we did shift the original design to be a little bit more icy to fit the episode even more. The Binding of Ippos, which is the one from Daybreak here, was actually one of the very first Gen 2 legendaries we worked on. It was right up there with Nevermore. It always had technical difficulties though, and went through multiple iterations before it became what we shipped, which is dope. So there you go, I think Lindsay probably describes the situation best. It's a mix of both worlds. It sounds like then, no, they didn't have a full set designed with Heart of Thorns to release with Heart of Thorns. There were a couple of gaps, and I would guess that those couple of gaps were the ones we saw in Episode 6, The Shining Blade and The Hammer, uh, and then they were inspired there. But, you know, it, it would be nice to have a 100% clear cut exactly which was made for the season and which wasn't, but there you have it. Um, and that's basically uh, the whole story, I suppose. Finally answered. Moving on, we have Zach Hank who says, What's your reasoning for doing these AMAs relatively quickly after release instead of waiting a few days to let the community experience a good chunk of the new content? I think this is not the first time that this has been asked or the first time I've read it out being asked on a video. Mo says, We take the cut, but this is the first real answer we ever had. We take the company down on release days. There's no normal development. There are no meetings so that we can play the game with you and respond to anything that comes up. This makes release days a unique opportunity to get everyone together. And frankly, we're excited about what just released and are happy to be able to chat about it. So you go, it's just a practical thing that they basically don't work on a release day, which is uh, pretty interesting to hear about, actually. Next, we have Blushing Yukemi, who says, Will dungeons ever be revisited with a lot of content coming out? Could they become raids for five uh, people? New wings, of course. Uh, and I just want to say I love your game and you. So the obligatory, when are we getting dungeons question comes up most AMAs. I'm regurgitating it on YouTube for you all because I love the sass in uh, Ben's response in this comment chain. So he says, right now, dungeons are not officially supported for new content updates. We have decided that Fractals is where we should put the team's resources. Anyone who's followed the game knows this has been the case for ages now. Blushing says, thank you for answering. I hoped the stance would change over time. Or reading between the lines, they hoped that them asking in the AMA would change their mind. Refreshing old content that is a bit more easy to access for new players seemed like a good idea to me, but Fractals are also awesome and I can't complain. One more question on the topic, have you thought about a five-man raid, but not in the form of Fractals? And Ben says, I think of many things that will never be implemented. <laughs> 
Brilliant. And look, this stings me too. You guys know I'm an advocate for five-man raids. The thing that I really don't like about raids is that they almost arbitrarily, in my eyes, went up to ten-man. And they'd be so much more accessible as five-man uh, with the same kind of difficulty scale and so forth. Uh, but yeah, so no five-man raids. <laughs> I love the way that that was revealed, even if it does crush my soul. Sunny Blueberry says, can we expect a rework slash bug fix for Winter's Day? For example, the script in Toypocalypse don't accept metal scraps anymore. Will we be able to enter activities as groups or get a guild activity instance where only guild members can enter? I love that idea. Come on, this is the kind of guild stuff we need. Uh, use the guild portal to get in there and stuff. Good stuff, man. Uh, Winter's Day is mainly activities, but not being able to play with your friends is a huge downside. Uh, I don't expect any promises. It would just be nice to know if you'd looked at Winter's Day or activities in general. Uh, so we don't hear about activities in general. You can kind of bypass this at Winter's Day by sync queuing, but it is annoying and it shouldn't be that way in my opinion. We get a response. You'll be able to enter Toypocalypse as a team this year. There will be two entrances, one for pre mates and one for players who want to be match made into a team like last year. But disclaimer, it's being tested. It's unlikely, but it's always possible a last minute major bug might result in it needing to be changed or delayed. How great is that though? And please, more activities. Keep going with that. That's exactly what we want. That's uh, representative of a system that could be used in many places. And it's very exciting. I don't care much about Toypocalypse, but I care about what this could mean. Next, we have ANTM, who said, What made you decide to give Legendary Weapons a Path of Firecrafting option? So, if you remember, this patch gave us the uh, Desert Mastery gift. I thought they'd stay tied to Heart of Thorns forever, and I think it's a welcome addition for Heart of Thorns and uh, Path of Fire players alike. So we decided very early on in Season 3, so this was a way back now, when it became clear we wouldn't be finishing the Legendary set by the end of the season, that we wanted to do the thing that would be most generous to the players, particularly those that strive for Legendary weapons, as it required a mastery that needed an expansion. We figured we'd just let people get it from whichever playground they like. So a great idea and a nice little example of them putting the players first and player convenience first and trying to do right by the player bites, I guess. So uh, there you have it, and I might even make the Binding of Ipos if I find my playtime drastically increases and I start getting a lot of money, uh, because I really do like that focus, and I use a lot of focus building classes. Just a couple more questions now. Uh, somebody basically asked, hey, what have we got coming up for the season? And Mike Z responded by saying, within each season of Living World, we experimented with production timelines, styles of content, rewards, and more. With season three, we found a place that made sense for us internally, but allowed each team to have the creative freedom to make each map feel different. Compare the battlefield of episode 4 compared to the exploration of episode 5. With each release, uh, we work on efficiency in how we operate, but also discover new styles of expression in what we do, and we are just getting started on this new season's journey. So Mike gives a very optimistic and uh, rosy kind of uh, view of the future here. I have to say, I'm always still flinchy looking at stuff that, like this and when uh, we look, draw back the curtain a bit because I'm still so worried about what we experienced in season 2 with the burnout and uh you know them biting off more than they can chew and running into issues with scoping and stuff and i really hope that season three taught them what they need what they need to know to understand how much they can put into a patch i want to see that this kind of istan style stuff is sustainable i don't want to hear that it's just a nightmare and hell to dev all this crazy stuff and uh you know th there's like ridiculous churn or whatever that it means it's going to be short-lived i want to feel like this is guild wars 2 heyday and it will go on and on and on. And I don't know, I, I think that Season 2 experience really did a number on me and makes it feel like it will be snatched away at any moment. So it's quite reassuring to see Mike Z, the game director, saying there, no, it's, it's, it's good and we're going to keep going here. Uh, but fingers crossed, right guys? Rosanta says, I'm going to ask my favourite question. This is a weird favourite question, Rosanta. But uh, I've never found an official answer to what's up with the waypoints in Timberland and Brisbane that got destroyed during Scarlet's living story. They were never repaired, yet there remain waypoints that are always contested. I was just wondering if it was overlooked or if there's actually a reason as to why they're never repaired nor transformed into something like a POI smiley face. Uh, we don't really get any answer as to whether they will change those, but we hear from a reading at Stevens. He says, I can't speak to why they weren't repaired, but as far as turning them into a POI goes, as far as I know, that would be essentially impossible. Part of the character record for a player is a list, informally, of what specific points they've hit. Waypoints, POIs, etc. And changing a point from one type to another would involve the kind of change to everyone's database records that would give any database dev the heebie-jeebies. So an interesting little look there as to why maybe we don't see they play with map completion objectives much. You notice in new patches, they add new systems, but they never like increase that kind of stuff. Uh, and so maybe that's uh, a sign of how they can't really affect too much of that, but there you have it. And so really, that was the last question. I do have one final comment. It's on the, from the marketing dev once again. 
who simply says this, uh, the one piece of universal feedback ArenaNet has received is we need to detail the content better within our living world trailers. This is so spot on and you're completely right. We already began discussions about how we can be more forthcoming in our content drops prior to their release. Uh, we will be making changes to the trailers we release and I ask you as well as the rest of the community to continue to provide feedback. Thank you for taking the time to write this constructive and helpful feedback. Please keep it coming and share any and all ideas we have on how we can get the Guild Wars 2 game played by more gamers. Smiley face. So, yeah, and I'll leave that there at the end of my video here. If you really uh, do want to see Guild Wars grow and so on, and you think you've got ideas, uh, shoot this dev a PM on Reddit. Why not? Could lead to something pretty good. And there you have it, guys. That's the Daybreak AMA. Uh, the best of the stuff that I could find. There's a chance I might have missed a couple of things. There were less comments on this than many of the other AMAs. And I don't know whether that's just because I got to it early, or whether, yeah, the buzz was a bit lower than it uh, deserved to be. I guess we'll see. Uh, I'd love to see what you guys have to say about any of these topics, of course, down below. And there'll be more videos on the game itself, obviously, coming up extremely shortly. I want to churn out quite a few more before I go off to do the competition judging. So thanks, everybody. Thanks so much for watching a week, and I'll see you very, very shortly.